Hello, good morning and welcome to Joy News Desk on the Joy News channel, DSTV channel 421 and Go TV channel 144. And on Facebook and on Twitter, we are on Joy News on TV and across the globe on myjoyonline.com. Coming up, this our senior and junior staff union of Metro Mass Transit declares a down strike. We have our reporter on the ground with live update. Also, in this bulletin, struggling to keep body and soul together, the story of Ghana's youth and unemployment. I'll uh, tell you about 30, the story of about 30-year-old Oscar Kakari, a university graduate who has been unemployed for three years. And GRA closes down some shopping malls in Accra for failing to implement the electronic transaction system in their facilities. We'll let, get more from the authority. This is your home of credible, fearless and independent journalism. I am Samuel Kojo. Ray, stay with us for details. Now this morning, workers of the Metro Mass Transit Limited are calling for the immediate removal of the managing director and two deputies for their gross incompetency in running the company. According to the workers, monthly deductions of their welfare contributions and loan repayment deducted at source are in arrears to the tune of 300,000 Ghana cities. These were contained in a letter addressed to their mother union. Now, um, the details of the statement is that uh, at a 2022 maiden meeting between the divisional senior and junior staff union comprising local chairmen and secretaries nationwide held in Kumasi on the 8th of October 2022, members present adopted the following resolutions on the subject matter below. That the underlisted problems have persisted in the company since 2018 and continue to worsen the plight of the entire workforce. A, management has refused to pay the underlisted deductions affected on staff salaries at various periods. Since 2018, one, personal loans deducted at source. Uh, two, tier two and three pension scheme deductions. Three, payment of uh, sedan loan deductions have mostly halted even though workers used uh, their uh, entire workforce uh, uh, use their pro provident fund as collateral for loans. This has brought untold hardship upon the entire workforce, particularly at a time that most banks are refusing loans to MMT staff. Again, senior staff welfare contributions and loan repayment, which are deducted from staff salaries at, at payroll every month within a range of only 9,000 uh, cities to 20,000 cities, are in arrears to the tune of a whopping 350,000 Ghana cities. The junior staff welfare is in the same situation. They continue to say that uh, uh, for the... Okay, so there's a point about full well that they again say that use of fuel without control measures. As a result, cost of fuel to the company on uh, average, particularly official car fuel usage, is way above buses for usage that bring money to the company. That for the past five years, no Metro Mass Transit Limited worker has received a full salary. Again, after 20 years in operations, MMTL has virtually no salary structure. Management has used discretion in sharing goodies that come out of our sweat. At the moment, management has implemented an annual appraisal for a section of staff in some unit and department without communicating any plan of implementation for the uh, other staff as to when the others will also be appraised. Uh, a widely anticipated phased implementation of the 2022 appraisal has turned out to be a scam. Now, um, again, management is unable to prepare tasks and respons responsibilities and supervise the staff population, leaving a gap in our operations, yet they complain of overstaffing. There are several duplication of rules within the system. A typical case, and to mention but a few, is where another manager, a departmental head, is made to oversee the operations of another, uh, uh, of a different bus type, that's a day, day Wu, and paid additional allowances when there is an operations manager. Well, my colleague Michael Ashley uh, has been at the terminal and joins us live from the grounds. Michael, what can you report? Yeah, so, I mean, 
before you get into the main yard you have to pump room, the first thing that gets to you is the number of bunches that have been grounded, sitting idle, some of which um, are without tasks or need a lot of work. Uh, it tells you how difficult and dire the situation is, especially the operations of the Metro Mass Transit uh, 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 buses. Now, what, what the staff have been telling me is that the management makes excuses of financial distress or they are cash trapped, but they tend to see that management is living a life of luxury and, I mean, spending monies where they are not really needed. I have a driver who spoke to me earlier. He tells me that uh, management is also using queries to intimidate some of the staff. That in situations where it boils down to uh, operational losses, like a car that needed to be fixed, that had to be fixed. Um, he said that he was sent a query, um, uh, uh, who was in a sense blaming him as a driver for failing to check that he had done that. But he actually earlier uh, reported that this tire was faulty, but that tire best on his way, even though he managed to cure the safety of the passengers and the goods within the car. He's been issued a query. He's not the only one. Many more people tell me. There are other issues of their money that have been paid, salaries, for instance, and they tell me uh, that for months now, some of them haven't been paid, and even if you are paid, that's a fraction of the amount is spent. Uh, Brace, all we are asking for at this moment in time is one, the three MDs must go and nothing else. Um, other than that, they will continue to with the um, sit down strike until these three individuals have been removed or an investigation has been carried out into their dealings in the company and cleared before they will return to work. Mm. Um, I, I'm, this will definitely affect their operations today. Uh, what did you see in terms of its impact on uh, people who are willing to travel through on the MMT buses? Well, so at the head office here, you won't have people who are traveling here. But you will see buses that, I'm told, were prepped earlier to work today have all been brought back to their station. They tell me there are more than 2,000 workers with the Metro Mass Transit, but today none of them is going to work, including buses that are supposed to leave um, any part of the country to other destinations. That is where we will work. From here, at the head office, I'm moving to Kanishi, where they have one of their bus terminals to check the impact. But clearly, if the staff are not working, then it means that those who are hoping for cost effective, cheap means of transportation will definitely be denied. Their options will be expensive ones. Mm. Uh, has the managing director and his deputies, those who are being accused of mismanaging the company, um, have you heard anything from them? Have they been around? So, I've been asking, I've been to their office, and what I'm told is that the top manager, the three individuals here, have not reported to work mm. yet. Mm. All right, thank you very much. That's my colleague, Papani Ashele, there. Moving on to other stories. The enforcement team of the Ghana Revenue Authority has served notice that its operations to get all entities to integrate their collection point to their electronic tax system is not targeted at only retail centers, but all forms of businesses. The move follows an, uh, the action by the team to seal some selected shops belonging to the Palace Mall in Laboni, Spintex Road, Atomic Junction, and Tema in the Greater Accra region. The following report has more. <laughs> The quest to get companies comply with the GRE electronic VAT system continues as the enforcement team sealed the premises of selected shops belonging to the Palace Mall in Laboni, Spintex Road, Weja, and the Regal Chinese Restaurant in Osu. <laughs> The Ghana Revenue Authority, however, allowed business entities that have complied with the laws by integrating their collection system with the electronic VAT system to operate peacefully. Addressing journalists before the exercise, Deputy Commissioner of Operations at the GRE, Kwesi Hagan, hinted that about 25 entities have so far complied with the law. We are imploring all of us to ensure 
that of the 50 taxpayers who have been hooked, are supposed to hook onto the system, all would have complied as at yesterday. So for those who have not been complying, the takeout is that please do so before we get there, because it is not our intention to come and close your place down. We want you to work for the taxes to be paid. So this is just a suggestion and a plea to the taxpayers out there that get hooked onto the Commissioner General's EVAT before preventive and enforcement actions are taken against you. We'll continue this exercise throughout the week until each and every taxpayer of the 50 assigned is hooked onto the system. We have engaged an initial 25. Yes. The Accra Central Enforcement Manager, Joseph Annan, who led the operations, warned the business entities not to tamper with the commissioner's tape used to block the entrance of their companies else face imprisonment. He explains. To ensure that these selected taxpayers comply with the law. Fortunately for us, the places we have been to, they all locked out their places before we got there. And that is good for us because we spent less time to get the places. We just applied the commissioner's generous tip. And please, you tamper with that tip, it compounds your problems because it can lead to an imprisonment. So if I were you, I will guide it jealously. But when we come to your premises and it's been tempered with, you have questions to answer. So there are places that we have not applied our padlocks, but the commissioner's tip is even much more weightier than applying the padlocks. The GRE revealed that series of engagements have been held for the selected shops before the October implementation date. Now, joining us through Zoom is Assistant Commissioner of VAT Administration, Philip Aqua, uh, to tell us more. Uh, Philip, thank you so much for your time. Tell us more about this particular exercise. Philip, can, can you unmute so we can, we can understand what you're telling us? All right. Uh, good morning to your viewers. Can you hear me clearly? Very, very. All right. So good morning to your viewers, and uh, thanks for the opportunity to have a discussion with you on this subject uh, this morning. Yeah, yeah. so, so I, w I wanted you to tell us more about this particular exercise that you are undertaking. So this is, uh, this is an exercise that's known globally. Uh, it's called electronic uh, invoicing system. So when you look at uh, global tax administration, uh, for the administration of VAT, this is a system that has been used to ensure compliance uh, for VAT administration. For a longer time, uh, we have administered VAT using the manual VAT uh, administration regime. And conducting research, uh, we realized that uh, the electronic invoicing system uh, is the, the way to go. So what we have done is Commissioner General has uh, implemented an electronic invoicing system that sits on the GRA server. And for all taxpayers that have been granted dispensation to issue their own invoicing systems, uh, their own invoices, Commissioner General is now plugging in into these various invoicing systems to ensure that all invoices that are issued are authenticated and validated by GRA. That's, so that's pretty much what we're doing uh, with this system. And for all taxpayers that uh, on the manual VAT invoicing regime, we are giving them a free invoicing system. So basically, if you are, uh, for example, a lawyer or an accountant who doesn't have uh, a, a, an invoicing system to issue an invoice, Commissioner General is giving you a free invoicing system to use. It's free of charge uh, to issue invoices. Mm. Uh, so, so these entities are the 50 you've been talking about. We, we, are, we know we've been told that 25 of them have been able to, you know, hook onto the system. Is that it? 50 entities? Correct. Mm. Um, now, how long have these businesses been operating without EVAT? So we started this project uh, early this year. So March this year, we started uh, engaging uh, businesses 
that we earmark for the first phase of the implementation. Uh, so this is a, a new system that uh, GRA is implementing. And uh, even though it's new uh, to the country, for most taxpayers that are issuing their own, uh, using their own system, issuing to issue invoices, it is not new to them. What GRA is doing is that for all those taxpayers that have their own invoicing system, mm -hmm. Commissioner General is plugging into those invoicing system to ensure that in real time or near real time, those invoices that are issued or receipts that are issued, Commissioner General basically has a, co uh, a copy of those invoices so that uh, before you even file, the Commissioner General knows how much taxes that you have to pay. So at the end of the exercise, uh, what do you hope to hope to achieve? So the objective is to ensure that we curtail the current abuse of the manual VAT uh, invoicing regime. So we know that uh, currently there are a lot of uh, print houses in the country that actually print uh, VAT invoices. And task, task, some taxpayers use these uh, receipts or invoices, collect the, uh, the taxes that are supposed to be paid to the government and keep those taxes. So what we want to do is get rid of the abuse in the current VAT uh, invoicing regime by ensuring that all the taxes that are due to the government are actually paid. Mm. So once you're doing that, what about the people who fall out of the 50, people who are given VAT booklet by GRA? Uh, what are you doing to ensure that they also don't, 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 don't keep money, so revenues that belong to the state? So there, there are two things. Uh, as I said before, we are uh, implementing this solution for two streams of uh, taxpayer groups. There are taxpayers who already have their invoicing system. Uh, system. So for those taxpayers, Commissioner General is basically plugging into their system. For the taxpayers who do not have uh, any invoicing system, Commissioner General is giving them free invoicing system to use. So, and those invoicing system can either be accessed via a mobile app or a web browser, or they can download those uh, the, the invoicing system onto their desktop for use. Uh, so those who are on the manual or issuing man manual VAT invoicing system will be uh, migrated to use this free invoicing system. And we're also implementing the solution in phases. So we've selected a group of taxpayers, like you rightly said, uh, 50 uh, from the start, and we'll scale up as, uh, as we go. Mm. Uh, how long do you intend this exercise to take? So we have, uh, there are three phases of the implementation. First phase is what we're doing now. And by the end of uh, Q1, 2023, we hope to have uh, brought on board 600 taxpayers. Uh, and then by end of 2023, we hope to have covered all medium task taxpayers. And then by end of 2024, we hope to have covered all VAT, registered VAT taxpayers in the country. Is it restricted only to the capital, Accra? No. So that's what, that's what I said earlier on, that uh, for all taxpayers in the country, so it's not restricted only to the Accra, only to Accra, even though uh, initially we have selected a group, a, a number of taxpayers that are actually in Accra. Mm. So, so you mean that the closure of uh, these malls and entities is also happening in other parts of the country? Yes. So for some taxpayers that we have uh, closed their shops, we are also doing the uh, same in other other regions mm. as well. Now, what strategies are you hoping to implement to ensure that any future infraction by business entities are forestalled? So there are two, uh, there, there, in fact, there are three uh, compliance tools that are embedded within the system. One is real-time monitoring. So uh, as taxpayers are issuing invoices, GRA is able to uh, identify whether or not they are uh, they are issuing the one the correct amount of uh, they, they are charging correct amount of VAT. They are also uh, issuing the invoices that they are supposed to issue. So we have real time uh, monitoring that that goes on at the back end of the GRA system. We also see how much revenue is coming in uh, on a real time basis, and then so that's the second compliance tool that uh, we we have. And then the third compliance tool is uh, we also coming up with an app so that anyone can basically scan an invoice or a receipt and verify whether or not that invoice is uh, uh, GRA certified. And we will very soon we will announce that so that general public will be able to 
uh, use this whenever they purchase something from uh, a VAT registers to verify whether those invoices are certified. Mm. Um, the other day when you went to one entity, the person was accusing GRA of, uh, you know, the processes there aren't that fluid. And therefore, if you apply to get onto the VAT system, it takes much longer time. And that's why he was operating without uh, the, the GRA certification. What are you doing in that regard to ensure that your processes are quite fluid, to ensure that people have the freedom to apply and get the certification within the shortest possible time? So for each taxpayer that is, uh, that is about to be involved onto the system, we assign a relationship manager to, uh, for each taxpayer. Mm. And we also have a technical person that works with each taxpayer to onboard them onto the system. So there's a constant engagement that takes place for, with each of the taxpayers that are being onboarded onto the system. Mm. So we make sure that no taxpayer is left out in as much as uh, and engagement and education is concerned. And we also have our support desks that, uh, that, uh, that are ready to answer any questions that uh, any taxpayer has on this issue. Mm. All right, thank you very much. Uh, that's uh, Assistant Commissioner VAT or VAT Administration, GRA Philip Aqua there. Now, severe food shortage is said to have hit the Walla Walla Vocational and Technical Institute in the Northeast region. The situation has led to the supply of inadequate and poor meals in the school. The school children claim they are being fed raw gari and rice without stew over the past three weeks. Eliasu Tanko joins us through Zoom with more. Eliasu, uh, what's the situation on the ground and what are you hearing from the students? Well, the situation is uh, very dire. Uh, from the students themselves, hearing from students themselves. In the for, for the past, uh, 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 so can, can, can you can you if you can hear me? Can you skill. can you reposition yourself? Your your line keeps breaking and and it's it's affecting the the information you, you are giving me? out. Can you hear me? Yes, I can hear you. Yeah, so the students claim that uh, for the past three weeks, they have been fed gari, only gari, and without uh, sugar or stew or whatever. And, and only this week, the management also brought in rice, and the rice too, uh, they are giving with us stew. Uh, the students tell me that this has uh, resulted in several health implications. Uh, some of them claim to be running diarrhea. Others said they are having uh, other stomach upset, and some of them are, are now asking to go home. Some of them also claim that they are compelled to go out into the Wale Wale Township to engage in, uh, for instance, carrying blocks for uh, con contractors to be able to get money to go and support themselves in the feeding process, just to buy sugar and steel uh, to eat with a gari that has been provided. And so it's really a very difficult situation in the school. They claim that for the past three weeks, they have been given only gari without steel or, 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 or sugar. Mm. What has the school administration say, uh, uh, you know, what, how, what has it said is the reason why this is happening? Well, we reach out to the senior headmaster of the school. He won't speak to us and uh, only directed us to speak with the regional education authorities we again reached out to the regional director himself he said yes he was aware of the situation but as we know this is a, a national crisis and, and so he uh, has followed up he has also put in his complaint to national authorities and they have not responded to 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 him and so yes he has confirmed that he's aware of the situation not only at the Wale Wale Senior uh, Vocational and Technical Institute, but also he mentioned the Bunkurgu Senior High School, which is also uh, suffering a uh, severe food shortage. According to him, uh, parents in that area, um, uh, yes, who have their awards in the school, uh, are having to contribute uh, some money to help the school management uh, feed the children. There. Also, we are hearing uh, uh, another 
say similar story at the Wulugu Senior High School. And this particular senior high school, you remember early this year, there was some uh, some rampaging or some riots in the school because of uh, food shortages. And this time again, we are hearing that the situation also in that particular school is also getting dire. Uh, at the vocational school in Wale Wale, the student told me that they are putting themselves to to hit on the street to protest against uh, the situation or to protest over the situation in the school. So very soon we can see some of the students in this school uh, coming together to protest uh, over this particular food shortage in their campuses. Mm, that's, that's interesting. Um, okay, Elias, I'm, I'm grateful to you for joining us here with this uh, latest update on that. Now to some other stories, some schools in the Volta region are also left with nothing for students to eat. This has forced the school head to write to the Ghana Education Service demanding immediate supply. We'll bring you details of some of these letters Joy News has intercepted. But first, Joy News, Rafik Salam reports similar situations and the impact of shortage of food at the St. Basilids. Uh, Technic Basilids, uh, Technical and Vocational Training Institute, and joins us through Zoom with uh, details. Uh, ra ra all right, so um, let, let me bring in my colleague, Kweku Asanto, who uh, is joining me with some of the letters Joy News has cited. Kweku, what are these letters that we've seen? What are the details? So we first have a letter from Alabano Senior High School, Senior High Technical School, written by Headmaster Reverend Samuel Pius, um, a letter who is raising concerns about the shortage of food in the school. Let me quote specifically what he said. He says, management of Alabano Senior High School respectfully rise to request for food to enable us to feed the students. This request has become necessary since the last emergency two weeks food supplied on 15 December, 15 September 2022 has run out. We hope our request will be given quick response. We currently feed the students with only breakfast and supper, and this can take us to Friday, 30th September 2022. So from this letter, the food supplies have already run out and they are really the under supply challenge. That is the letter from Alabama Senior High School. There's another similar letter from the headmistress of Azatime Senior High School in the Bane in the Volta region. It also says the same thing that management wants to report with urgency the food situation in the Azatime Senior High School. The school store, as of now, is having only four bags of plates, two bags of sugar, and few tin tomatoes. Virtually, there will be no food from next week going. This unfortunate situation has been reported to the regional Papa store coordinator and other officers that matters, but the situation has remained the same. Signed, Rebecca Mausi, the head mistress of this senior high school. So these two senior high schools in the Bota region, clearly railing under the supply food shortage. Mm. All right, Goku, thank you very much. Now joining us through Zoom is the executive director of the African Education Watch, Kofi Asari, who has been recommending cost sharing to prevent some of these mishaps. Uh, thank you so much, Mr. Asari, for joining us. This recurring issue, what can be the permanent solution to it aside your initial recommendation, which has not been adhered to as of now? Mr. Zari, um, I'm trying to find out from you what could be the permanent solution to this recurring situation in senior high schools where uh, from time to time, we would have a report of food shortages. What could be the permanent solution, aside your initial recommendation, which, of course, has not been added to us at now? The permanent solution is based on a factual diagnosis of the problem, not the symptom. The problem is that there is no money. The government has no money. Our education system, our economy cannot sustain um, raising regular revenue to feed all 1.3 million students in school. That is the reality. In June, the ministry indicated that, I mean, in July, the ministry indicated that its debt to buffer stock, I mean, its debt to senior social suppliers was about 370 million Ghana cities. And it was working to reduce it because that was the major cause of the shortages. As I speak to you, the buffer stock debt has rather increased to 470. By the end of the year, we should be hitting 500 million Ghana cities. 
So the problem is that our economy cannot support raising regular funding to enable suppliers supply food without hitches. The solution is that get parents to support government in feeding their children. That is the solution. Go government must admit that there must be a conversation around enhancing and streamlining parental participation in the provision of food in senior high schools. It is based on that conversation that the framework for facilitating the parental contribution of food in senior high schools can be developed and adapted. But if we continue the current approach where government is playing ostrich, that we don't need parents, we alone can feed the children, we can never solve this problem. The government needs more than a billion, about 1.3 billion a year, to feed the 1.3 million billion, 1.3 million children in senior high schools. And that money is no joke, and it's not available. Mm. The 1.3 billion you're talking about is it CDs or is it US dollars? 1.3 billion CDs. Okay. In fact, the free senior high school budget. It's all about. It's mainly about feeding. About seventy percent of the budget goes into feeding, and so if government is able to get parents to meet it halfway, okay, you are spending about four point, about five point five cities a day to feed every month. If government is able to get parents to meet it halfway, if parents are taking half of the cost and government is taking half of the cost, or if government is able to use means testing data from the Ghana Tax Service, data from the Ghana Household Registry where we know where the poor households are in the poorest part of these countries. In seven regions, we have data on poor households. The Statistical Service has data on um, poor households based on their expenditure under the, Ghana living, under the various Ghana living, service, Ghana living standard service. So government must be intentional that, look, we can't sustain running this program this way. Let's build data infrastructure that will enable us to target the policy so that people from poor households can enjoy free food. Mm. But people from rich, rich households or average households should be able to pay for just the food. Okay. That is how you manage and sustain an important social intervention policy like the free senior school policy. All right, grateful that you could join us. Now, also joining us uh, on phone is the deputy ranking member on the Education Committee of Parliament, uh, Clementa Park. Thank you so much, sir. Now, this is an issue where we all need to come on board. Government says that I'm not looking at trying to change this free SHS. People like you and other people in education have said that we need to look at how we can bring on board parents. At this point, where do we go from here? Well, let me say good morning to you and uh, say a big hello to my good friend, uh, a very nationalistic-minded uh, individual, uh, Kofi Asari, uh, who personally and uh, through his uh, organization uh, have served uh, Mother Ghana and the educational sector uh, very well with a few of favor. Yes, I, I, I agree with uh, the uh, opinions expressed by uh, Kofi. And uh, I still do not understand why uh, government, uh, the president, uh, feels adamant in taking the bold step to actualize what he himself uh, hinted us a couple of weeks ago. Uh, I speak to his uh, admission that uh, there was the need for a national conversation around the uh, policy, its implementation, and in particular to address some of the challenges that uh, some of us have been pointing out uh, time without number. Uh, if you look at the, uh, the policy, uh, over the last uh, five years, uh, the total investment uh, is $7.62 billion. Although, very strangely, the same minister who quoted that figure, the Minister for Finance, uh, in a budget statement on the floor of Parliament, uh, just uh, 2022, came to Parliament and is now quoting 5.3, a matter that we will resolve because I filed a question to that effect. But the point to make is that for 2022, we, we approved $2.3 billion to finance the program. And it is true that the biggest chunk of the funding has to go to the provision of meals for the students. So granting that 
uh, we have these challenges almost on a monthly or by monthly basis of uh, shortages of uh, food items. Mm. What prevents the government from releasing the monies that we have approved to deal with these issues in a much more substantive way, mm. even as we look at the bigger, broader national conversation? If it is the case that the money that Parliament has approved is not available in the consolidated fund or in the public pay to be disbursed so that buffer stock food suppliers will be paid tenuously so that they can supply the food regularly, then government ought to let us know so that the rest of us Members of uh, the public, you know, can see what can be done to rally. As we speak, look, the situation is, 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 is not good. You know, the heads of the institutions, many of them, are at their wit's end trying to manage taking food items and other supplies on credit. You know, why don't we just open up and be sincere and honest? I mean, some of the parents are contributing are contributing to keep the kids fed in the schools. We know of situations where old boys and girls are contributing to keep the kids fed in the schools. So why are we playing the ostrich? Pretending as if all is well, when we know it is not. So if the money is not there, tell us that the money is not there. Let us know. Invite parents. A lot of parents are willing. They are doing it anyway as we speak. Because no parent would know that your world is not being fed in school, or is not having three square meals in school, or is not having a, a, a nutritious meal, and you sit back. So parents are already contributing to sustain their work in the schools. All boys and girls are mobilizing and supporting them. But it can be formalized. If only government is willing to be honest and transparent about the, the, the challenges that we face. Mm -hmm. So yes, 2.3 billion, why is the money not being disbursed? If it is not there, let us know. As Kofi said, invite parents. People are willing to come on board. Mm -hmm. They are willing to support. But it is very difficult when government continues to play ostrich and tries to pretend and tries to, you know, compel all of us in the face of contrary evidence to admit that things are rosy. When in fact things are not. So it is, it is most unfortunate, but I mean, we have alternatives. There is a way out of this quagmire. But those who are leading the process must be open and transparent and must be honest in inviting all of us to the table in the short term, as we also look at the, 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 the long term uh, issue of having that national conversation so that we can see how we can resituate. Okay. The program Don't, and its implementation to yield the maximum benefit that we all desire. Doc, I'm grateful for your time. Dr. Clement Park is a deputy ranking member on the Parliament Education Committee. This is News Desk on the Joy News Channel. We'll take a quick break when we return. Now, before, his siblings sacrificed their education for him to complete school with the hope of securing a job to cater for the family. But after completion, he explored many opportunities to get a job without success. This is a story of 30-year-old Oscar Kakari, a university graduate who has been unemployed for the past three years. In Joy News' is latest documentary titled Job for the Boys, my colleague Emmanuel Jivenu has been engaging Oscar and other youth struggling to keep body and soul together. 30-year-old Oscar is one of the millions of unemployed young Ghanaians. He lives here at Konkomba Bola Top, a growing slum in the greater Accra region of Ghana. Oscar completed his tertiary education in 2017, but has never been in a long-term employment. While on the academic ladder, he never imagined that a search for job in a resource-rich country will be a daunting task. After graduation, it's been three years now, unemployed. I've tried many possibilities send my CVs to institutions, some to, I send them online through Gmail, but I don't get any reply from them. So I have to just hustle. 
23-year-old Razak dropped out of school due to the inability of his parents to sponsor his education. Today, Razak makes these sandals for sale on the street of Accra. Uh, me, myself, you know, the, I just hustle from Taru to this, you know, so every day I had a hustle. Me, you know, when I, the, the moment I wrote uh, BC, you know, when I see my back, you know, I, I don't get nobody to help me, so I just start hustle. Uh, it would be better for me to hustle, so I can't say anything. It would be hustle in the inside. One for 20 Ghana. You go buy this thing, buy this. Tell you do and finish, you know, nothing the inside. The things see there, you know, go help us, uh, especially the channel goods. The worry uh, this one, if somebody can hold it, ah, you ask, you know, it be China. Until you go talk, uh, you understand, um, until you buy them. Um. If a large uh, segment of the working population is unemployed or underemployed, which is also another issue, then young people are competing with older people for jobs, right? So you need to fix the larger economy to make sure that it is producing jobs generally. The full, the full documentary, Job for the Boys, as tonight at 7 on the Joinish Prime. You may want to make a date with that. We'll take a break. We will return with business. Stay with us. Hi, good morning. Welcome to business. My name is Daryl Kwao. The Deputy Minister of Works and Housing, Abdullah Banga, is urging the use of green technological solutions in solving the country's housing challenges. Speaking at the launch of the 2022 Ghana Green Building Summit, he noted that the housing and construction industry plays a crucial role in Ghana's fight against climate change and stakeholders in these industries should embrace green innovative technologies to ensure a sustainable environment. There's more in this report. The Green Building Summit is a forum created to build conversations about the need for green technologies in the country's construction landscape. Speaking at the launch of the 2022 summit, the Deputy Minister for Works and Housing, Honorable Abdullah Abanga, said the construction industry plays a crucial role in Ghana's fight against climate change and hence, stakeholders in the industry will have to adapt green, innovative technologies. This, he believes, will ensure a green and sustainable environment. He further added that his ministry is on course to setting up a Housing Authority with the mandate of regulating and planning housing developments in Ghana. According to the 2019 Global Status Report for Buildings and Construction, almost 40% of the energy-related greenhouse gas emissions are from the building and construction sector. And as the policymakers, developers and built, built environment practitioners, this obviously calls for the need to collectively contemplate on alternative ways by which our buildings could optimize water conservation, recirculation, and reuse towards achieving water efficiency, particularly in our cities. Similarly, we need to embrace upon innovative technologies towards developing smarter cities that are hinged on clean and sustainable energy options, such as renewable energy solutions. Meanwhile, the Minister for Energy, Dr. Matthew Poku Prempe, also stated that Ghana is on a path to achieving its energy mix target of 10% renewable energy by 2030. VRA has built 20 to 22 megawatts of solar projects and completed them in Navrongo, Lora, and Kalio. For the first time in West Africa, we have constructed a 1 megawatt solar voltaic panel system floating on the Weedown Reservoir. We have installed totally about 120 megawatts representing 2.4 of the national generation mix. We continue to deepen our efforts in this regard, considering that by 2020, we should hit up 10% of the generation mix. 
Commending Ghana on her efforts to ensure a greener environment, the British High Commissioner to Ghana, Ms. Harriet Thompson, said Ghana has shown leadership in taking steps to ensure energy sustainability, but added that there is more the country can do to harness the opportunities in the transition space. So Ghana is doing a lot of work in this space. Energy transitions are always massively complicated, and particularly in a country where you need to look at accessibility to energy as well as sustainable energy. Um, it means that you you have to factor those two sides of it in. There are huge opportunities through sustainable energy options to improve the accessibility to energy at the same time. Uh, and we cannot see this transition to sustainable energy sources as being at the expense of economic growth. There is huge scope to do both of those things in parallel and to make an advantage of that shift to renewables to in fact create new job opportunities, new economic development opportunities. Now, Republic Bank Ghana has introduced a pension-related mortgage product to help address Ghana's housing deficit. According to the head of mortgage banking department, Dan Ajete Muhenu, the product is specially made to cushion pensioners during their retirement age. He spoke to Joy Business at the launch. Pension mortgage allows you to buy a property through your pension fund. All income and gains within pension schemes are exempt from income tax and capital gain tax. Both rental income and profit from the sale of the property will not be subject to these taxes. Dan Mohenu, head of mortgage banking, indicated that this is to cushion all private and public sector workers. What we seek to do is to support customers to acquire homes, leveraging on their tier three um, contributions. And so what we, are, what we are saying is that we put a lien on your tier three and then we advance 100% mortgage financing so that you are able to acquire a home. So it's quite simple. Our processes are seamless, straightforward, and it's quite flexible also. So we entreat all um, our uh, prospective uh, homeowners to visit Republic Bank. We we'll give you the fine details make you understand what a product is, um, is about, and then you can make a choice as to which home you want to buy. Every Ghanaian or every Ghanaian worker or every businessman at least owns a home throughout their lifetime. And so it's important, and if you look at the housing deficit that we have in Ghana right now, we are trying to assist and um, offering financing to prospective homeowners so that they can also buy homes and pay us over a period of time. A pension mod and that's uh, business. Thanks for watching. Sports is coming up next. All right, so welcome back. And it's time for us to talk about sports. And Lawrence is already in the studio with more. Uh, Lawrence, good morning. Good morning, Reese. How are you? I'm good. Yeah, there was Champions League football yesterday. Yesterday, yeah. Mm. The likes of Real Madrid, Chelsea, PSG were all in action. Okay. For Real Madrid, they were held to a 1-1 break against Shakhtar Donetsk. They needed that 94th minute header from Antonio Rudiger, who had to suffer a cut in the face, in the process. Oh, so uh, he scored yes. and sustained that, that, that cut? Yeah, it, was, oh. it, was, it was a nasty cut. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, on the other front, Chelsea recorded their first win in Italy since 2003. They beat AC Milan 2-0. The game started well for AC Milan, but at, like, in the 16th minute, they had to suffer a red card when Tomori well, fouled Messi Mount in the box. Mm. And Chelsea were awarded the penalty. Jorginho went on. To score from there before Premier League, Aubameyang also added a second. Paris Saint Germain. No, but, but on Chelsea, I've heard their supporters now talking about portable, portable. They are playing some fluid football. <laughs> oh, Chelsea. No, four, four wins in a row is, is, is something to celebrate, especially oh, really? considering their start to the season. Uh, anyway. Paris Saint Germain, back to back games, have drawn with Benfica. Mm. Uh, yesterday, you, you I feel the Chelsea AC Milan match was the biggest of the of the evening. So for the game to end, Benfica came back in the game. The, both teams scored through a penalty shootout. And for PSG, I think they should have they should have buried the game or they should have end a win. But for the flag which went up against Kylian Mbappe in the last moment of the game. So today there are some games that are going on, some other games going on. Mohamed Kudus Ajax will be in action against Napoli. Remember what happened at the Yuan Kreifer? Last week, last week it wasn't good for Ayas mm -hmm. because they had to suffer a 6 1 drubbing at the hands of the Italians. Yes, Ayas scored first and then they went on to lose 6 1. And in now a, they are going away. It's, it's, 
It's it's a difficult task for them. Well, yes. Mm. So Rangers also host Liverpool. Liverpool beat them in the first leg at mm. Anfield. Atletico Madrid are facing Club Bruges. This will be of interest for Ghanaians because Kamal Soa is in there. Kamal Soa is one of the Ghanaians who is delivering quite a good performance in the Champions League this season. He scored two in three appearances. Bayer Leverkusen will also host FC Porto, Barcelona, Inter Milan. Mm. Another cracker. Yeah. You know, should Barca, <laughs> should Barca lose this game, it could be the case of they likely to drop to the Europa League mm. because they have just one win from the three games they've played already. But I'm not sure they will lose it. Well, it depends on how Inter Milan will play. Mm. <laughs> mm -hmm. Victoria Pleasant will host Bayern Munich, mm. Sporting Lisbon, Marseille. The Sporting Lisbon match, there is a Ghanaian interest for Abdul Fattah is there. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And then there's Tottenham Hospital Frankfurt. Tottenham, they are having a busy season mm. because it's not going too well in the Premier League. Same for them in the Champions League. Last week, they, they played a 0 0 draw against Andrew Frankfurt. So they hope to make amends when they play again today. So, as I was saying, you know, Mohamed Kudus, I like, I like the fact that he's being talked about. You know, his goal against Liverpool, which was the second group game for Ajax in the Champions League, was voted the goal of the month um, for Ajax in, in September. Mm -hmm. So, yeah, we are looking forward to him delivering another good performance against Napoli. We are not overly expectant of the results mm -hmm. because I asked against Liverpool from what we saw in the first leg. We, we saw it was a mismatch. And then I'm going into this game, going to play in Italy. Napoli have been on some good run of form. They currently lead the Italian Serie A table. Mm. So if you are going up against such a team, you need to be well prepared. For Ayas, they've not found that consistency yet. I thought the game in Netherlands was quite a, a game for them to make a statement, but that was far from <laughs> a statement they wanted to make. Okay. So hopefully things get better for them today. Mm. Okay, all right. Uh, we wish all the teams all the best tonight, and that's how we wrap up the bulletin. There's more news on myjoyonline.com. My name is Samuel Kojo Brace. Do enjoy the rest of our programs. Good morning.